Hello. Today we're looking at another poem where love goes sour. In this case, Elizabeth Jennings' 1966 poem, One Flesh. Now the title has a religious reference. Um, in the eyes of God, when you get married, it's like two souls or two bodies being fused or yoked together, becoming one flesh. Despite the title, though, this poem is not great PR for the institution of marriage. I mean, read it and you might conclude, do you know what, I'm better off just getting a goldfish. Now, I'll warn you in advance, this poem is not exactly a bucket of chuckles. I mean, it's shot through the really fat vein of melancholy, of bleakness. And over three stanzas, the poem One Flesh observes an ageing couple that's now locked in this loveless, joyless marriage. And in the bedroom, their physical separation mirrors their emotional separation. I mean, they sleep in separate beds, eschewing or rejecting or avoiding any contact of any form, physical or verbal. It gets even less perky as the poem ploughs on. The narrator reflects on the couple's previously loving relationship, but now a lack of feeling, or perhaps a sense of shame or guilt, that they still have these latent sexual urges, that stops bodily contact. So much so, in fact, that they no longer have sex, this couple. And the final stanza, the narrator considers how odd their coldness is, given the once deep passion that characterised the relationship. Cut to the last line, and it's revealed in these last lines that the old couple are in fact the narrator's parents, and she sees herself as a product of the once strong bond between them. So we've looked at what this poem's about. Now we're going to delve into the text and start winkling out language techniques, structural techniques, perhaps a few contextual factors too, we'll explore them. Then we'll cobble together a model paragraph, the like of which is going to rock an examiner's world. So we'll lock in first on a simile. This is stanza two, line one. And the couple is presented as tossed up like flotsam from a form of passion. Now flotsam is like debris or junk on the surface of water. It's often linked with shipwrecks. You know, shipwrecks produce flotsam. What that does is it suggests the relationship has damaged them in some way. Marriage has destroyed or wrecked something vital inside of the pair of them. But I also like to winkle out a secondary interpretation because I know the examiner loves it when you evaluate language and pull out multiple meanings. So let's lock in on the t, f and p sounds here, which are known as plosives. And what plosives are great at doing is capturing a, a harsh or, as my oh-so-hilarious picture show at the bottom there, an aggressive tone. And used here, these plosives suggest a kind of bitterness or bleakness, which reflects well on the state of the relationship cynical or negative state of the relationship. And there's another rattling good simile in stanza three. This time we're going to try and pull out three interpretations, which will have the examiner wiping the floor polish off his bottom lip when his jaws hanging open in disbelief at our unalloyed genius. Here's the simile then. It talks about the silence between them like a thread to hold and not wind in. Interpretation one, a thread is something flimsy. And that alludes perhaps to the fragile state of their relationship. But we're not done there, no sir. Second interpretation, uh, the reference to a thread between them, might actually have a vaguely positive or optimistic undertone to it. Perhaps there's the vague trace or ghost of a bond still between them, alluded to in this line. This simile then, very rich in ambiguity. You know, there's more than one interpretation to be had. But I've got my own favourite interpretation for this line. Let's read it again. The silence between them like a thread to hold and not wind in. Now, for me, I think of this idea of the silence being like a thread as suggesting that silence between them is very fragile and unstable. There's huge pressure ballooning up, building up in both of the people in this relationship. And, you know, it could explode in this kind of tsunami of rage and passion and angry words. So it's like a really unstable, uneasy alliance or silence between them. We've done language. Let's toddle along and look at structural techniques now. In this case, punctuation. Um, there's a line, when the couple touch, it's like a confession of having little feeling or too much. Now you notice there's a dash there between feeling and all. 
Interestingly, that sentence would still make sense without it. So clearly, its inclusion is designed to have a certain effect or impact. Now, what that effect is, is it creates a, a jarring tone, or a, a jolting tone or note. And that captures very cleverly the, the awkwardness, the anxiety that characterises the couple's relationship and their attitude towards each other. Because there's a strange melding of feelings here. On the one hand, um, when they touch, there's a lack of feeling, as if they have no love for each other anymore. But also that shame could be born in the fact that they still, on some level, harbour some sexual yearnings, some sexual urges that aren't being satisfied. Ah, Mr Taylor, what is this shameless self-promotion? Look, if they want to buy your book, your wonderfully written guide to imaginative and descriptive writing, they'll follow the link in the video description. Now take these good people back to one flesh, please. Yes, this is an invaluable revision resource, cheap as chips and twice as satisfying, but come at, come on now, Mr Taylor, play the game. Sorry about that, folks. Back to business now. The second structural technique we'll look at is rhyme scheme. Now, only the last line of stanza three deviates from a fixed rhyme scheme. This poem, One Flesh, has an A, B, A, B, A, A rhyme scheme. And its fixed structure conveys a sense of entrapment, which very cleverly alludes to or telegraphs the idea of the couple being trapped or locked in a loveless marriage. Perhaps also that fixed structure might allude to the inevitability of love dying in long-term relationships. You know, there's like a, a fixed certainty that love is going to erode or break down over time. So let's lock our literary laser vision over that last line of the poem. Uh, it deviates from the established rhyme scheme and what that does, because we go from A, B, A, B, A, A to A, B, A, B, A, B, what that does is it draws the reader's attention to that last line, which renders the narrator's revelation that this couple are actually her parents, it renders that more shocking. If you like, the structure or the deviation from the established structure forces our focus onto that revelation, which as I say, renders it a bit more shocking, a bit more of a powerful payoff. So we've looked at the writer's craft, you know, Elizabeth Jennings's use of language and structure to great effect. Now we're going to consider some contextual factors that engage with the poem. Elizabeth Jennings, she wrote One Flesh in 1966. The 1960s saw sweeping changes in Western attitudes towards sex and sexual behaviour. Um, let's see, the law uh, made it easy to divorce. They finally copped on and decriminalised homosexuality. There was also medical advances. Um, the, the pill came online. So you know people could have consequence-free sex. They could have sex without the inevitable worry of pregnancy. And ultimately, what all these things did is they contributed to people taking a bit more of a relaxed less moralistic, less religious view towards sexual behaviour. And this was reflected in sex, sexual depictions in literature and on stage and screen. Now, I'm not saying that in the 1960s it was wall-to-wall -wall wobbly bits wherever you pointed your eyes, but what I am saying is that the arts would have been presenting images and ideas that would have been deemed offensive and indecent 10 or 15 years beforehand. And here's one of my patented goofy cartoons that just loosely sums up the division, the changing attitudes ushered in by the permissive society. Perhaps Jennings' original 1960s audience then, drunk on a sense of sexual liberation, would have perceived the image of a chaste couple to be even more shocking. Then there's Jennings' Catholicism. She was raised, as were her parents, as a Catholic Elizabeth Jennings. Uh, this branch of Christianity takes a very dim view of divorce. Marriage is a lifelong commitment. doesn't hand out divorces like Smarties. I think if you're very, very lucky and get an annulment, but divorce, I think, even to this day, is still a big no-no. Which leads to an interesting insight, because if this poem is autobiographical, if the narrator is actually Elizabeth Jennings commenting on her own parents, it may explain why Jennings never married. You know, the depressing decline that she witnessed and the physical and emotional bond between her parents may have deterred her from taking a husband herself. Maybe she took one look at her parents and the loveless, sexless codependency that now characterises their drab lives and thought to herself, no thanks. The realities of marriage then very much at odds with Jennings' Catholic beliefs. Now we'll take some of the ideas 
drawn from this video and weave them into a winning paragraph, the sort that's going to very much put a smile on the examiner's face. The question will imagine is something like, um, how does Jennings present a troubled relationship in one flesh? In one flesh, Jennings uses rhyme scheme to present her ideas on troubled relationships. A fixed ABABAA rhyme scheme prevails for two stanzas and only deviates in the final line of stanza three. This establishes a sense of entrapment. It conveys powerfully to the reader that the couple are locked in a loveless marriage. You'll notice here that my paragraph is framed according to the point evidence explanation structure. I make a point that's linked to the question about troubled relationships. I back it up with some evidence. I talk about how the rhyme scheme captures that troubled relationship and then I explain that the fixed rhyme scheme suggests that they're trapped in a loveless relationship. And then I go deeper. Moreover, launch them into a secondary interpretation. Moreover, the deviation from a fixed structure in the poem's last line focuses the reader's attention on the revelation that this old couple are the narrator's parents. This serves to render the revelation more shocking. The second paragraph then put me in line with those highest marks by pulling out a secondary or alternative interpretation. And then I seamlessly leap to a contextual consideration. Perhaps Jennings's contemporary readers will perceive the couple's sexless marriage as particularly shocking. The 1960s saw the rise of the permissive society, with people embracing less moralistic and more liberal attitudes towards sex. Woohoo! Conclusions! You might want to run an eye over this page, summarising as it does all that intellectual gold I've been pounding for the last ten minutes. Read it at your leisure. And that's one flesh, folks. Hardly a poem with a message to please the troops. It seems that love dies, but the shell of the relationship lives on. Yeah, thanks, Elizabeth Jennings. I look forward to that. Till next time, abiento.